Welcome, everyone. It is wonderful to be gathering with you in this virtual way. I'm Rabbi Avi Strasberg. I'm coming into you from Washington, D.C., where my main work 
is bringing Hadar's programming and learning to DC. And I'm so excited to be joined this evening by Rabbi Yosef Goldman. Hi, I'm Rabbi Yosef Goldman. I'm here from Philadelphia, where I am co-director of Hadar's Rising Song Institute, where we cultivate Jewish spiritual community through music. Avi, it's great to be with you tonight, studying Torah to get us into the spirit of Pesach. Absolutely. Um, so I've got to say, this, um, this is a difficult time that we're in. And also one of the incredible, incredible blessings of this time is that from the comfort of all of our respective living rooms, bedrooms, kitchens, back porches, wherever we're finding you right now, and to get to come together in this virtual way and see so many of your faces um, populating into this space, it's just like an incredible, incredible blessing to have you spend an evening with us. Um, so from DC to Philly to all of your living rooms, we're appreciative um, to be learning some tour with you tonight and hopefully to be bringing a little warmth and comfort into the spaces that we find ourselves in. So the question we're going to be thinking about tonight is a question of redemption, timely for Pesach. Um, the, the passage that we're going to start off with, um, I came across it in the course of um, Daf Yomi um, a couple months ago, for those of you who are doing this cycle. Um, and it's a question that really, it's a text that really stayed with me. Um, and we'll look at the text together. But the text opens up the possibility of redemption happening at night. And opens up the possibility of there being a redemption at night, but that maybe there's a partial redemption. And it just really got me, there was something to me about the idea of a redemption that begins in the evening, a redemption that is not yet a full redemption, but is a partial redemption that really stuck with me um, and got me thinking. And so that's really what I wanna think about tonight, that there are really two questions I wanna explore with you. Um, the first question is, when we think about the Exodus from Egypt, when we think about the story of our redemption, when did that redemption take place? When are we imagining that it take place? Does it take place in the dark of night? Does it take place sometime at sunrise? Does it take place in the light of the day? When did that redemption take place? And for that matter, why does it matter? Why does it matter at what time does it take place? The second question I really want to explore with you is what does night look like? When we think about night, what are the feelings that night conjures up? What are the experiences that night conjures up. And I just sort of want to explore to you as we explore the notion of redemption, as we explore a redemption at night, a redemption in the day, I also want to um, really look into and sort of deepen our own thinking around what is night, what is contained by night, and what more might we find in night. So those are our two questions that we're going to be thinking about. And I'll just say, um, personally, um, you know, I'm, I'm finding these questions particularly relevant in the time that we're in. Because um, speaking for myself, I'll say that it feels like we are in um, a bit of a dark time. Um, I don't think it's a stretch to imagine that um, while both it is night for many of us, we are in a, a sort of metaphoric night. Um, and that there's a lot of um, questions and, and uncertainty that we have when this night is going to lift. Um, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the regular questions that my five-year-old has been asking me is when, is, when is Corona going to pass? When is it going to stop be a thing? Um, and so part of what I hear in that question, sort of in the language of Pesach is, when is redemption going to come? When are we going to redeemed, be redeemed from this moment that we're in? Um, and my questions around there is, what is that, what is that redemption going to look like? And when, we, when will we know when we're already in the beginning of that redemption, right? Will we know when we've started flattening the curve? How will we know that that redemption is starting to take place? So those are, I, I think these questions are all very specific to Pesach, but as I'm thinking about them, they also feel very much specific to our moment. What's the experience of night? What will redemption look like? And will we see it when it's coming? Okay, so those are questions on my mind. So um, with that introduction, I want to turn to the source sheet. Um, so you have the link in the source sheet in the chat. Rabbi, so I want, yeah. I want to draw people's attention again to the chat, both for the, the source sheet, like Ravavi said. Also, you can put questions there and our host at Hadar, Morty, will direct those questions to me and Ravavi. So you can keep an eye on the chat, but for now that's where you can pick up the source sheet if you haven't found it yet. Great, yeah. The, the chat lines are open for you. Um, so we're going to look at the um, first text together. 
this text comes from Masecha Brachot. So this is when I was saying that there was an opening text that got me started. This is one of those two texts. So the context that you need to know for this, there's always context, right? When you're jumping into a Gemara text. So the context here is we're in the middle of a machlok. We're in the middle of a dispute between um, Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. And the dispute is, we already know, you know, from earlier in Brachot, we already know that it's really important in your personal prayers to juxtapose in the morning, to juxtapose the blessings of Geula, of redemption, that are the end of the Shema, to go right into your Amidah, to go right into your Tefillah, that you want to juxtapose Geula, redemption, the end of the Shema, right into going to the Amidah. And the idea being that um, the person who really um, believes in the redemption, the person who sees themselves as being a part of the chain of history, um, the people that God redeemed, that is the person who God will redeem um, and listen to their prayer. So you really want to just juxtapose in the morning, Geula, um, with the with the Amidah. But there's a question in the Gemara, while it's clear that you need to do that in your morning prayers, it's less clear whether or not you need to do that in your evening prayers. And so that's the dispute, whether or not also in the evening, it's important to juxtapose Geula, redemption, with your Amidah. Is that juxtaposition still important in the evening? And so Rabbi Yochanan um, is arguing that you do not need to juxtapose, that in the evening, this is very foreign for us because we have a very set prayer order in our minds. Obviously, Shema does in the evening go right into the Amidah. But he's saying, actually, that might, you might not need that order at all. That Rabbi Yochanan is saying, you don't need Geula to go into your Amidah in the evening. And Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi is arguing that you do still preserve that order even in the evening. So now let's look at what is their machloket? What is their dispute about? So Rabbi Yochanan Savar, Geula me orta na mehave. So Rabbi Yochanan says uh, that Geula in the evening, there also was a Geula, there also was a redemption that happened in the evening. I want to draw your focus to the word um, for evening there, the Meorta, which is interesting that you might recognize it, the, in the evening the word for light, that there's actually something really powerful that the rabbis didn't want to call the word for evening that they wanted the word for evening to contain the word for light, right? That the darkest and scariest time, they didn't want to call it by a darker, scary word, that even the evening contains the light. So Rabbi Yochanan says that there was a redemption also in the Orta, also in the evening. It just wasn't a complete, a ge'ula It wasn't a complete redemption until the morning. So there was some sort of redemption that happened in the evening, but the complete redemption didn't happen to the morning as opposed to Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi Savar, Kevan de lo havia ele mitzafra, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi says, because the redemption didn't really happen until the tzafra, until the morning, lo havia geula me'alaita. It wasn't a full redemption. And so therefore, according to Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, you do not need to juxtapose the geula to the amida. So you have Rabbi Yochanan, you have these two different positions. You have Rabbi Yochanan saying, Ula, the redemption actually started in the evening. It's true. It wasn't a complete redemption, but it was a redemption nonetheless. And so therefore, it is important also in the evening to juxtapose, to include the mention of Geula into our davening. And you have Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi saying, but no, not really. Like it wasn't a real Geula. The Geula, the full redemption didn't happen until the morning. And so that's the only redemption we care about. We care about the redemption that is the morning redemption, the complete redemption, we're fully free. We don't care about the sort of like beginning half redemption. And so there's no need to really focus on redemption in the evening. So that's our opening question here. So that's the framing text of um, when does the moment of redemption happen? And why do we care whether redemption happens in the evening or in the morning? So I just want your text, that text in your head. And now I actually wanna take a step back. Because before we can really talk about whether redemption happened in the evening or morning, before we really can care about that question, I think we have to do a little bit thinking about what is evening. What do we think of when we think of evening? So I'm actually going to take us, I want to take a pause here. If we were in an in-person class, I would field your answers. I want to invite you to chat your answers into the chat box. Um, if you just want to type out, when you think about evening, what comes up for you? What are the emotions? What are the feelings? What is contained by the evening? Darkness, fear, unknown, foreboding, calm, quiet, shadows. So you can see yourself. Lots of different things contained by the evening. Settling, a peace. 
rest, intimacy, the death of sleep and unknown anxiety. It's amazing that um, so many things can be contained by the evening and for so many different people, the evening might mean really different things. To acknowledge Larry's question, um, while I, not a question that we'll answer, I just want to acknowledge Larry that you asked a question that the, that the Talmud asks right afterwards. So uh, you're, you're thinking along the right lines, but uh, you know, why it's not really juxtaposed, there's other stuff that comes in the middle at night. Yeah. Good so, question. A liminal state, an uncertain state. Okay, so keep your answers coming. I'm, ex I'm excited to hear all of your thoughts on evening. Um, and now I want to turn to some of our texts to see what does the Torah think about evening? What do the rabbis think about evening? So take a look at text number two coming from Bamin Bar from the Book of Numbers. So the context here is this is just after the incident of the spies where the spies go in and scout the land and they come back and say, we can't do it. They're too big. We're too small. This, this mission that you brought us on, it's a futile mission. We're not going to be able to make it into the land. Okay? And so they're, they're um, well, I'll, I'm not going to tell you what they're like. We're going to read the text together. And so the whole community broke out into loud cries. And the people wept that night. And the Israelites railed against Moses and Aaron, and they said, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, the whole community shouted at them, or if only we might die in this wilderness. Why is the Lord taking us to that land to fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be carried off. It would be better for us to go back to Egypt. And they said to one another, let us head back to Egypt. And so that opening image there, and they gave up, they raised up their voices, and the people cried by Laila Haku. So what is the experience in this text? What is the experience of night? In this text, night is fear, right? We saw that in the chat. Night is fear. Night is longing. Night is a deep despair. It's a despair for how did we get to this place, right? We're in our lives better where we were before. It would be better to die here. Things were good in Egypt. Night is a time for tears. It's a time for crying out. It's a time for all the people coming together and for all the people wailing together. And it's also a time in which we lose hope. It's a time in which maybe things that during the day we would be able to pull through, we would be able to go on, that at night, that response, we can't do it, they're too big, we're too small. It's a time where we, where, we, where we give in to that despair. We give in to that desperation. Mm -hmm. At least in this text, night is a time of deep sadness. Just want to sit with that feeling for a moment. Okay, I want to take us to another text. So look at text three from Lamentations. So from one text in the desert, in the wilderness, to a text about Jerusalem, to a broken Jerusalem, to a Jerusalem that's sitting there. Echa yashva badad, ha'ir rabati am, ha'ita ke'amana, rabati bagoyim, sarati bemedinot, ha'ita lemas. Alas, lonely sits the city, once great with people. She that was great among nations is become like a widow. The princess among states has become subject to other people's power. Bacho tivke balayla, again, the crying in the night. She cries out in the night, vedimata alechaya, and her tears are on her cheek. En la menachem mikol oveha. There is no one to comfort her from all that love her. Kol roeha bagduba. All of her allies, all of her friends have betrayed her. Hayula le'oivim. They have become her foes. What is night in this text? You have that same sense of despair in the text from Bamin Bar. I think there's a sense of hopelessness. I think this text also adds on the loneliness, the badand, 
It adds on the isolation. It adds on a sense of there's no comfort at night. I think that isolation feels like this is a text that feels relevant right now, that night as a time of the comforts that we once knew, it's we're sort of reinventing comfort. We're reinventing ways to comfort each other. That everyone's sitting in their own isolated places, but reinventing finds of ways of coming together. So two different texts, but I think they're sharing, sharing a sense of loss, sharing a sense of despair, sharing a sense of sadness. And this one really also layering in that sense of loneliness, the sense of isolation. I want to look at one more text with you. We're going to look at Masechet Sanhedrin. And I think this part of, I really appreciate seeing um, some of the different ideas of night um, coming up in the chat. While there's a lot of the sadness and fear and loneliness, um, there's, also, there's also some other words that are coming up. Night can contain other things. Um, it can be a time of transition, of stillness, of peace. Um, and so Masechet Sanhedrin, the text that we're going to look at next, is going to very much be on this text from Echa on Lamentations, the Bachot Balaila, she cried out into the night, but it's going to offer us a different vision of what night might be. So let's take a look at text four together. What is Bachot Balaila? How do we understand her crying out, the Bachot right, the doubling up of crying in the night? Devar Acher, one way to understand that, Balaila, Shakol Abuche Balaila, Kolo Nishma, that everyone who cries out at night, their voice is heard. That's a different, that's a different understanding of night. Right, in Echa, we have her crying out at night and there's no one to comfort her. In Echa, she's alone. In Echa, all of her friends have betrayed her and now, on this very text from Eicha, how do we, right, this is, this is a reading on Eicha, it's so interesting. How do we understand that actually anyone who cries out at night, that night, there's sort of like a deep receptivity to crying out. The gates of tears are open that when you cry out at night, your, your, your voice, it's not that you are alone, but you're actually your voice is heard. Another reading, Belayla, how do we understand Belayla? Shakola boche Belayla, kochavim umazalot bochim imo. That everyone who cries out at night, the stars and the constellations, they cry with him. Okay, it's not only, it's, it's like it's taking it up. It's not only koloni shma, it's not, not only that your voice is heard, but actually there's this image of being outside in the night and crying out in this sort of open vulnerability. And the stars and constellations, all of nature cries out with you, that there's a joining together. You're no longer alone. It's not just that you're heard, but there's a joining together. One more. Devar Acher, Belayla. How else can we understand Belayla, the Bachot Ibke Belayla of Echa? Chakol Habuche Belayla, Hashomeo Kolo, Boche Kenegin, Kenegdo. How do we understand Belayla? That anyone who cries out at night, the one who hears his voice also cries with him. So it's similar to the second one in the sense that the constellations and stars are crying, but now it's not just sort of like a universal natural world empathy, but actually a person, anyone who hears that person, they will cry too. And so there's sort of these three different levels, these three different readings of how else might we understand night. There's the night of Bami Bar, um, that is a night of losing hope and despair and fear and loss and longing. There's the night of Echa, as we understood Echa, which is also that same despair, but of the loneliness and of there being no comfort. And now there's another reading, Masechet Sanhedrin is offering us another, another vision of light, what night might be. Where in the first reading of it, night is that whoever cries out, their voice is at least heard. Minimally, you're heard. Maybe you're not responded to. Maybe you don't get what you wanted, but you're heard. Second, that the stars and the constellations join together with you. And third, that human beings join with you too, that whoever is opposite with you is going to join with you. Um, so I bring this text as offering just an, another expansive way of looking into what night might be. That night might be all of those things, some of those things that we said before. Night is still fear for some people. Night is still darkness. Night might still be despair. Night might still be a lack of hope. 
but Masechet Sanhedrin is really pushing against the text of Eicha. I, th- I think against the way we would normally read Eicha to say, but actually let's take another look at night because there might be something else there. It might actually be that night in this time of extreme vulnerability might also be a place where we find connection. It might be that night might be a place where we find community, a community of the stars and constellations, a community of the person who is standing in front of us, who cries with us. And that night actually might be a time of hope. Yosef, I'm wondering how these texts sit with you and what, what you see in them. So far, it's, it's been so beautiful to, to hear you teach and walk us through these texts, Ravavi. And thinking about, actually, I'm thinking about the next two songs that we're going to sing. And um, it's like um, in the verse of Mina Mitzar Karatiya, there's this sense that I call out to you from the straits. You answered me with the, your divine expansiveness. This sense of it being both things, this trans, but a transformation of perspective, of seeing yourself in a narrow place and feeling isolated, and the darkness somehow becomes like a, like a, a cocoon, like a presence, a warmth, um, a mystery, and um, yeah, I can imagine that at those at the time of the destruction or when the Book of Lamentations was being written as sacred poetry to express the emotional state that was, that was, um, the, that was being experienced by those who were either exiled or dislocated from their homes in Jerusalem. I can imagine similarly without the, uh, without the benefits of technology that they were also not able to sit together and study or sit together and celebrate or sing that the these all these images of night were coming up at different moments we're going to sing um now a song from later on in the book of of Eicha. and if you go to um, the, the final page you'll see it kumi roni balayla from the second chapter an error on the sheet. It's not from Chabad. It's from um, the rest of Chassidim. Um, person who's writing this, um, this poetry, poetic expression of the emotional state of isolation and dislocation, has a moment of saying almost like breaking the wall and saying, "Sing with me, sing with me. Arise as the night begins, where, where we find ourselves right now, and pour out your heart like water." in the presence of the divine. So we sing the same melody that we opened with. I invite you at home, if you recognize the melody or as you catch on, please sing along with me. I lie, 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 I lie,
point one thing out about this melody <clears throat> somebody referenced another song that has a similar motif there's something that happens in this song so on the one hand we've got the words rina kumi roni balaila cry out in the night could have implications of joy. It could have implications of song, but at its base, it's just a calling. And the, those notes that we find in the evening service during the week and many other times during the week, da -da 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 carries a longing it carries, in all of the tradition, musical traditions where we find these notes, it carries a longing and a, a sense of, of deep emotion. And uh, give a little preview of what's coming next. We are gonna sing a song by my colleague, Deborah Sachs Mintz, to words from, from Hallel, to to words from Psalm 118, Mina Meitzar Karati Ya. From the Meitzar, from the narrow place, from the straits. <coughs> I called Ya. Even that word Ya forces you to go from closed mouth to an open mouth. Ya. Anani Ba Ya. I respond, God, God responded to me from that expansive place of the, of the divine. Adonai li loira, God is, is on my side, I will have no fear. And that's a loaded line. Anytime the psalmist says, I do not fear or I will have no fear, you know that the psalmist is grappling with fear. What can man do to me? Yes, what can humankind do to me? That is certainly not a, a real a sense of, um, of fearlessness, but walking the edge. One more time. Min karatiya Oh, 
chance to hear the full version of this as Deborah imagined it very soon from Rising Song Institute. I think that melody really captures these two sides. There's this openness to the melody and also this kind of plaintiveness that captures, I think, the fear underneath the statement of the author says, have no fear. What fear? Mm. Have no fear. We'll sing some more later. So we're in the Mezar. We were in that dark and narrow place in Egypt. And so the question is, the question that we're exploring tonight, we were in the night. The question is, when we call to God, how did we get out of there? When did that redemption happen? When did it take place? When you think about that redemption, I want you to think about the story of the exodus from Egypt. And I want to ask you, what are you imagining when you think about, when you think about the redemption? What's the image that comes to your mind? What are you imagining? Is it dark? Is it light? Is it hopeful? Is it scary? Are you alone? Are there people? What does that redemption look like? What does it feel like? As you're thinking about that, and feel free to chat that into the chat. I want to go back to the text itself. I want to go back to Shmot. And we're going to spend a time. We're going to, we're going to read it. The question, that, the question that we're asking is, when did the redemption begin? And we can't really ask that question without going back to Shmot to think about it. So this is our chance before Pesach to spend a little bit of time with the story. Ufaro he crave. By Suvene Israel de Nahem. And as Paro drew near, the Israelites caught sight of the Egyptians advancing upon them. Greatly frightened, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. And they said to Moshe, Was it for want of graves in Egypt that you brought us to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, taking us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt, saying, let us be and we will serve the Egyptians? For it is better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. 
But Moshe said to the people, have no fear. This goes back to Rav Yosef, right? That when you're told to have no fear, when you say that I don't have any fear, it's because you're, it's because you're in a place of fear. It's because they're coming from fear. He says, have no fear, stand by and witness the deliverance with which the Lord will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. And what, what's just happened before this? The final plague, Makat Bechorot, right? In the dead of night, in the darkness of night. And so this is the moment that's happening, that we're in the darkness of night. Makat Bechorot has just happened, and they're crying out. They're crying out to Moshe. The Lord will battle for you. You hold your peace. Then the Lord said to Moshe, Moshe, why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. In the darkness of night, just go forward right? Why are you stopped? Just go forward as if it's such an easy thing to do to just go forward. And you lift up your rod and hold out your arm over the sea and split it so that the Israelites may march into the sea on dry ground. And I will stiffen the hearts of the Egyptians so that they go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his warriors, his chariots and his horsemen. Let the Egyptians know that I am Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. The angel of God who had been going ahead of the Israelite army now moved and followed behind them. And the pillar of cloud shifted from in front of them and took up a place behind them. And it came between the army of the Egyptians and the army of Israel. Thus there was the cloud with the darkness and it cast a spell upon the night so that one could not come near the other all through the night. The lo karev ze el ze kol halayla. What is night? What is redemption? It was darkness. It was total darkness such that one person couldn't come near another person. That goes back to the isolation of Echa. It was like you were, you were, someone wrote throngs of people. There were throngs of people. And yet what you felt, the experience of that throng was total isolation because one person couldn't go near the other. It was so dark. Then Moshe held out his arm over the sea and the Lord drove back the sea with a strong east wind all that night, the night, and turned the sea into dry ground. It's amazing just imagine you, I don't know, for me, I think of Makat Bukharot, obviously that happened at night, but when you think of the sea crossing, these throngs of people happening in the total night, in the total pitch blackness, that all of that just go forward as though you could go forward into total darkness. The waters were split and the Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. I wonder, could they even see the wall of water as it split to either side? We have the image of imagining the wall of water, but could they see that visual? The Egyptians came in pursuit after them into the sea, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen. And we skip a little bit. Moshe held out his arm over the sea, and at daybreak, Lifnot Boker, the sea, return to its normal state. All this is happening at night. And then at that last moment, Moshe held out his hand and then finally the seas return to where they are, right? Flooding the Egyptians, that's the Egyptians drowning. And that's the moment of mourning. That's the morning, moment of daybreak. And the Egyptians fled at its approach. But the Lord hurled the Egyptians into the sea. The waters turned back and covered the chariots and the horsemen, Pharaoh's entire army that followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. Now it's light. But the Israelites had marched through the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord delivered Israel that day from the Egyptians. Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the shore of the sea. And Israel saw the wondrous power which the Lord had wielded against the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord. It's interesting, the fear there. They had faith in the Lord and in God's servant, Moshe. So the question that I would put to you is where was that moment of redemption? If you were asked to say, right, and I'm asking you, that's what this class is, but if I asked you to say, when did the redemption happen? What was the moment of redemption in our leaving Egypt? When did it happen? When did it start? When did it end? When would you say, oh, this is the moment when they were redeemed? Does it happen at night? Does it happen in day? At what moment? And so that's really the conversation. That's the, that's the debate of the rabbis. So we're going to go back into the text from Brachot. We're a few pages forward in the Gemara. We're on Brachot 9a now. And we're still having this discussion. Amar Rabbi Abba. So Rabbi Abba says, 
Hakol modim shenigalu Yisrael mimitzrayim lo nigalu ela be'erev. So there's your answer. I'm making it seem like it's a question, but it's not a question. According, to, and it, this sort of goes back to what uh, Rav Yosef was saying. Every time, you know, if you say um, I have no fear, it means you have fear. If the Gemara says Hakol modim, everyone agrees. You know that not everyone agrees. Okay, so actually, it's quite simple. According to Rabbi Abba, according to Rabbi Abba, Hakol modim, everyone agrees that when the Israelites were redeemed from Egypt. They were only redeemed at night, that the moment of redemption clearly happened at night, and everyone knows it happened at night. Just to sort of throw this into, I mean, the whole conversation here is obviously just five pages earlier in the Gemara, they were having a major debate as to whether or not it even made sense to talk about redemption at night. Also think about in the Haggadah, um, the moment of the Haggadah, where Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah says, you know, I've lived to be 70 years, and I've still never figured out why we say Yetziat Mitzrayim at night. Um, which is just to say, on one hand, you're having the hakomodim. Everyone knows it only hap it happened at night. On the other hand, we know that this is not something that everyone knows because actually, whether or not um, redemption is a part of our nighttime story is 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 very much up for debate. Okay. Rabbi, Rabbi, we have a question. Okay. Yeah. There are a few people that are that are asking about what what is redemption? Is redemption an an event? Is it a moment? Is it a process? People, some people have ideas about it and some have none at all. Yeah. So when you're using the term redemption, what does that mean to you? Yeah, I think that's the, really the question of the, I think that's the question of this year. Um, mm -hmm. I think for me, when I'm saying redemption, I mean, we're giving, we're giving away the end of this year here, but I'll say, I think for me, when I say redemption, I'm, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about freedom. I'm thinking about release. Um, I'm thinking about release from fear. I'm thinking about release from anxiety. I think I'm thinking about freedom here, sort of in the bodily sense. And yeah, I mean, the short story, the short answer of this is like, yeah, it's a process. It is a process. That's, that's, that's the thing that it's, and I think that's part of what's so interesting is that the rabbis are talking about, to some extent, the rabbis are talking about it as if it's a moment, um, as a moment that we can pin down. And it makes sense um, because that's what the rabbis like to do. Even in their conversations in the Gemara where they're talking about twilight, they're trying to pin down the exact time of twilight, twilight like a blink of an eye, the exact amount of time um, that we want to, it's almost like we want to pin down the moment of redemption. And that's part of what I'm, what I'm, um, what is it, a straw man? That's part of what I'm trying to push us to do. And also, of course, the answer is, is that it's not a moment, is that it's a process. Um, and that's part of really what I want to push us towards, is that to the extent that I think the rabbis, some of the rabbis want to say, well, the redemption didn't really happen until the morning. Part of what I want to do is I want to push back and say, but it started in the evening. And part of the question is, of why does it, let's read on, let me read on just to the end of the source, and then Ooh. I want to come back to this, and I want to hear Rav Yosef's thoughts on this, okay? But it's a, the, the question that people are asking is, is, I think it is the question of what actually, what does redemption look like? How do we know the moment of redemption if redemption is a process? Um, okay, so everyone agrees that redemption happened in the evening. How do we know this? Because God took, um, your God took you out of Egypt at night. It's interesting that the question is redeemed, but the verb there is being taken out. But regardless that it's about, when did we come out? We came out at night, which is interesting because, well, we'll go on in the source. Shayatsu, but when they came out, lo yatsu el bayom, but when they came out, they actually only went out during the day. So the redemption happened at night, but they only came out during the day. Shinemar mi macharata pesach, yatsu venez rabi yad rama, that the day after the pesach offering, they went out with a high hand. So here you have, Everyone knows redemption happened at night. So that is clearly on the side of redemption happens at night. But the actual going out happened in the morning. But it seems like Rabbi Abba would say redemption is a thing that happens at night. But we have also in another Baraita, Tanya Nami Chache, alternatively, that God brought you out of Egypt at night. But did we actually go out of Egypt at night? Is that verse actually correct? The halo yatsu elabayom, didn't we in fact go out during the day, which is what was suggested by the source above, shine emarmi macharata pesach yatsu b'nei that on the day after the Pesach offering, that's when they went out with a raised hand. Rather, what is this teaching us? Ela melamed shehit chila lehem geula mi that um, God started for us the redemption at night. 
Okay, that, so this is the question of the process, that it's not that it was a complete redemption, but that the redemption started and it wasn't even completed until they go out. And so perhaps this seems like semantics. I don't think it's semantics. I'll say, why, why, why does it matter? Why am I making a de big deal? Why does it matter whether redemption happened in the evening or in the morning? I think it matters, um, I think it matters for two reasons. The first reason is it just gives me hope if we say that redemption started at night or redemption happens at night, it gives me hope that redemption can happen at night. It gives me hope that we don't have to wait till the daylight. Um, we don't have to wait till the sun is shining to be redeemed. That actually redemption, that redemption can happen even in the darkest place, place moments, even in a place of fear, even in a place of anxiety, that even from that place, redemption can happen. It gives me hope that redemption can happen at night. Okay, that's the first thing. And the second thing is, there are the rabbis who want to say, well, it only started at night, right? But if it, if it didn't complete until the morning, it's not a real redemption. It's sort of like glass is half full, half empty experience. Do we care, is a real, do we even need to associate redemption with the evening if it only started in the evening, but they didn't get out? What we really care about is that they got out. And I guess, and the, but, and then there are the rabbis who push back and say, but it started in the evening. Right? The fact that it started in the evening means that there is redemption in the evening. And so it's not only, I think, that it gives me hope that redemption can happen in the evening. It, it I think, emphasizes that we have to recognize partial redemptions for what they are. That sometimes a partial redemption is a redemption. Sometimes the beginning of redemption is a redemption, okay? And so that goes to the question, I think, of well, isn't redemption a process that it doesn't happen, right? The expression is overnight or it does happen overnight, but it doesn't happen the flick of the switch and i think that's part of what to say sometimes we're waiting for we're waiting to call something a redemption until we're totally out until we're across the sea until we, the end is not only the end is sight but until we've gotten to the place where we're going and i think part of what i want to push us and i think part of what the rabbis who are saying but if it started in the evening it actually still is a redemption to recognize the beginning stages of redemption as being the redemption itself and, and the power in recognizing that what do you think about that, Rabbi Yosef? I think it's beautiful. I think, yeah, sometimes we find ourselves in life um, and just getting out of bed or not getting out of bed, but being able to choose to not get out of bed and honor our body's needs or our, our, our health needs is a step, is a win, is redemptive and and that should be honored. I just want to also look at it back in the context of the of the the book of the Masechet uh, Brachot. Um, it's also, you know, the the urgent question, like you brought up, are our prayers even answered at night? What is this thing that we call Arvit or Mariv evening prayer? Is it a th is there even such a thing as evening prayer? because the night is dark and full of dangers and we're not clear if it's obligated, we're not clear what night is. This is all coming up in that context. Even though we, we were promised that the redemption was gonna happen at night and we see that it happens at night, but there's this need to, to hold something tangible that the rabbis have that, that gets in the way of just a, sometimes allowing themselves to open up to, to, uh, to what, what is around them you know, that needing to pinpoint when is chatzot, when is the middle of the night? God promises, it's, I was thinking about it as you were teaching, that so much of what goes on in the first chapter of, of Brachot is asking when is the middle of the night so that we can determine when are the bounds of reciting the evening prayer. And that, that time, chatzot, is the same time around the time that God promises to come to the homes of the Israelite and start our Israelites and start the whole process of taking them out in the middle of the night, God says around midnight. But there's this need to hold on to something tangible. And part of this is saying, you might not know when that moment was, when the depth of darkness was until afterwards. Yeah. Something that feels powerful about that, which might be for me feels, and that you might not know until where the depth of darkness was until you're already beyond it, until you're already in that, which feels hopeful to me. Um, 
thinking about partial redemptions, thinking about redemption beginning in the evening, thinking about redemption as a process. I want to look at text seven by Rabbi Abraham Yitzchak HaKokhein, um, the Ein Aya. So he is writing a commentary on the Ein Yaakov. Um, the Ein Yaakov is the collection of agadic material from um, the Gemara. So this is specifically um, the Ein Aya on Mesechet Brachot, so on the text, on our text right here. So on the line, Amar Rabbi Abba, Hakol Modim, Shen Nigalu Yisrami Mitzrayim, Lo Nigalu Ele that everyone agrees that redemption only happened in the evening and that when they went out, they only went out during the day. So he's going to lay out redemption as a process. So let's, let's look at um, what, is, what is his process? How does he understand it? The redemption from slavery to freedom with respect to a whole people occurs in two stages. The first is the freedom that a person feels within himself. The rising up as one goes from the debasement of slavery to a free person and his own master. And the second is the action that is revealed to the world in being a free people alive and with agency. And so he says, what is the two part process of redemption? What is the redemption that starts in the evening and is only completed in the morning? That redemption happens in two stages. It happens, there's the first, the personal redemption that has to happen. I can only be redeemed. I can only be seen as redeemed when I see myself as being worthy of, re, of being redeemed. When I see myself as, um, as redeemable, as I sort of find my own, I harness my own power, I harness my own freedom. So the first step of redemption is getting one's own self individually to a place of being redeemed, of being worthy, of feeling powerful, of feeling like change can happen. And then it's the second step is the communal, um, the outside world recognizing that I have been redeemed, recognizing that change of power and sort of ascribing that change of status to me. But I can only, it seems like I can only get to that second place when the outside world recognizes that change of status after going through the first place of, of, sort of initiating that process within myself, of finding that own freedom in myself. So there's first the personal freedom and then that freedom, that status being seen and witnessed. Um, and respected and observed by everyone else. And so he goes on, he says, even more so Israel carries both of these aspects, these, the internal and the communal, because personal freedom is the beginning of the completion of themselves and the sanctification of the attributes, attributes through Torah, mitzvot, and her wisdom. And the external revealed freedom is that which enables Israel to be a light onto the nations. So he's saying, also, so too with Israel, is the, the, the first part is the personal is Israel taking on Torah and mitzvot. It's like worrying about ourselves and taking care of ourselves and doing our own internal work, turning to God and doing the performance of mitzvot. But that's not actually where the mitzvot are supposed to end. It's not just about this internal um, compass, all always looking inward. Actually, part of the mission of being um, Jews in the world is an external light projecting that light outside and being a light onto the nation. And so then, then he's saying, and that's actually the second step. So just as there's the personal of, I have to see myself as being um, redeemable, being worthy of redeemed, and then I am seen in that way. And so too, for Israel, there's the first step process of taking on Torah and mitzvot. And then that is what allows us to then project outwards the community to be that light onto the nations. And this is which, what enables Israel to be a light onto the nations, of which a large part has already happened even today. And this process is finished when God has compassion on God's people, because from Zion, Torah goes forth, and the coastland shall await his Torah. For this reason, redemption is divided into two parts, the evening and the morning. When Israel was redeemed from Egypt, the internal redemption was at night, in which the essence of it was the good feeling of their personal freedom. And when they went out, they went out only in the day with a hand raised and revealed for all the world's inhabitants to teach of their actions revealed in the world, to enlighten for the good all those created in their shadow, to be enlightened in God's light, as it said, and nations shall walk by your light, kings by your shining radiance. What do you think about this, Rav Yosef? I love the idea of an inward of a process that begins internally and moves outward with, in, as it says, that it moves outward. I don't, I can't see what the, where the translation of that is exactly, but the, that 
there's a process of something that we begin inward, and then there is the rachamim that helps us along. There is, there is divine mercy. I think if we, we could say the same thing for the earlier stage as well, that, you know, first each the individuals had to see that there was a self there that was, that was crying out. And then it was met with, oh, you're, you're, you're here. You're ready to be redeemed. Let me, let me come help you. Um, so I think it's, it, it's a beautiful balance of this idea of agency and promise of, of um, divine uh, help and help and being joined by others if you're willing to open yourself up to the risk of finding redemption. Yeah. I think what I love about this text um, is I just think that those questions that, you know, that I was being pushed on is like, you know, what is redemption and, and what actually, and isn't it a process or is it a moment? Um, I think this text just really captures, for me, you know, it doesn't feel semantic, the evening or the morning. Um, and I think this text really captures that it's, that it is a process, um, that pre redemption doesn't happen in a moment. It's not a flick of a switch. Um, and that we can be in the moment, we can be in the redemption sort of even before we realize it, or even before there's been any sort of change in status or change in the world, but that the seeds for that redemption are already being planted. The inner work for that redemption is already happening. And my question, both in the Pesach story and also in the, in the moment, in our story right now, in our own moment right now is, what are those redemptive acts that are already happening in the night? What is the, like, because we're not going to be, it's not, you know, when, when you think about, and it's so hard to imagine right now, when we think about our world returning to our world, how it's going to change, it's not going to be overnight. It's going to be a process. Um, and so to the extent that some of us may be finding ourselves feeling that sense of, sense of night, that sense of despair, that sense of loss, that sense of hopelessness, I also wonder is it possible that we're already in the night and there are already some of those redemptive acts are taking place? Could we already be in the beginning of redemption and we don't know it? What are those redemptive acts? And so that goes to, I think, what Rav Yosef was saying about sometimes redemptive acts are um, just breathing in the morning. Sometimes redemptive acts are um, getting out of bed. Sometimes redemptive acts are getting through um, a Zoom conference call. <laughs> you know, in one piece that, that sometimes redemptive acts are, you know, giving your neighbors a box of matzah because they're not able to go to the store, um, that there's all sorts of um, redemptive acts that are already happening. And, and that might actually be the beginning of the process that is ultimately, it's not, we're not going to get out of this until the morning. And we don't know when that morning is going to be, but what if we're already in that redemption right now? Um, I wanted to look at one more um, text with you together. It's the last text on the source sheet. It's a poem. Um, this is the poem by Mary Oliver, The Uses of Sorrow. Someone I loved once gave me a box full of darkness. It took me years to understand that this too was a gift. Let me read it one more time. Someone I loved once gave me a box full of darkness. It took me years to understand that this too was a gift. So I'm thinking about the moment we're in now. Um, and I'm thinking that we're, we're in a dark place. Um, we don't have to, um, to, you know, to the extent that part of our, our mission in, in Pesach is, you know, kol adam chayav l'urot but we're, we're obligated to see ourselves as if we came out of Egypt. We're, we're sort of in our own um, Mitzarim right now. We're in our own dark place. Um, and I think the dark is all of the things that, that a lot of people said earlier. You know, I don't deny. I think the dark is fear. I think there, there's real fear. I think that there's real loneliness. I think we're dealing with a lot of mourning, um, a lot of different types of mourning. There's real loss. There's death. Um, there's real hopelessness. All of those things are happening right now. We are, we are, there is real darkness happening. And also, with this poem, makes me wonder is, and what else is in the darkness? Might there be a gift of the darkness? Something that I've been thinking about a lot, um, Rabbi Avi Kilev, who also um, teaches at Hadar and has a great piece in the Pesach Reader that's coming out specifically, who it's also called um, Redemption at Night. 
different, different, um, but si similar content, but a different, different text that she's looking at. Um, something that she learned from um, a teacher of hers, um, Kelly Lewis, is um, in, in dark times asking the question, but what else is true? That it's true. Mm -hmm. The darkness is true. The fear is true. Um, the sense of isolation is true. The real death is true. The mourning is true. All those things are true. And what else is true? What else might there be in the darkness? What might be, is there a way that we can hold the darkness? Might there be a gift in the darkness? What are those redemptive acts that are already happening right now? And so I just keep coming back to the question, what else is true? Have you Yosef? What else is true? That is beautiful. Thinking back to the verse that we sang of Kumi Roni Balaila <coughs> and the text from Brachot of um, who hears the prayers. Um, that there's, I've been thinking a lot about the idea of um, expressing one's the essence of one's self in that moment or is is itself a prayerful act so whether it's you know it's calling out in joy or in pain or in sorrow in the midst of darkness if we're able to access what where we are and offer that outward then that is heard and so what else is true you know, to not forget to look at to look at ourselves and see ourselves beyond that and then it, and even if we are not able to just to give give some expression to where we're at just a reminder that prayer can be just that it can just be calling out in the anguish of the nighttime with the promise that there will be something that, that hears us Love this, um, what was it that Ora was saying about redemption being imagining, what was it that she wrote? These lines are coming in so fast. Redemption is starting to imagine the world we want to create. It's a vision and then an, ex and an expression of something that else that might that might yet be and that is not yet and that we uniquely as humans have the ability to to imagine what is not yet i think Rabbi Yosef is going to lead us in some singing now as we begin to close out mm -hmm. um but i want to suggest people are already doing this and it's so amazing um I want to suggest that as we do some singing with Rav Yosef, if people want to continue writing in the chat along the lines of what else is true. Um, I think it's really heartening to see other people's answers of what is, um, it doesn't deny, it doesn't deny the darkness and it doesn't deny what's hard. Those things are real. Um, but what else is true? To get to read each other's answers as we do some singing. Thank you. So this is one of the older pieces of poetry that we have in our liturgy, post-biblical post poetry, that we find in the back of the Haggadah, from a poem um, called Vaihi Bachati Halayla, which is the opening line of the chapter of Exodus that describes the redemption that begins at night. And drawing on verses from the prophet Zechariah, he, um, Yanai um, invites us to imagine a time when day and night, when there is no day, when there is no night, Karev Yom Asher Hu Lo Yom Below Laila, bring near a time that is neither day nor night. And so we can imagine uh, what we've been speaking about, about um, what we started with of the meaning of, of 
the negative connotations of night and the transformation that can be maybe is part of what the prophet Zechariah means of seeing the, uh, the what is possible within the night. Let's do this again, call and response. Join me. Ram ho da ho da ho da. Ram ho da da. Kilecha hayom aflecha halayla. Kilecha hayom aflecha halayla. Together. Karev yom, karev yom. Asher hu. I 
Thank Rav Yosef for his song. I want to thank all of you. Laura. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for joining us here tonight, all from your different places and coming together in this way. Um, I'm wishing us the nights of Masechet Sanhedrin. I'm wishing us a vision of night in which when we call out, our voices are heard. I'm wishing us a vision of night in which when we call out and when we cry out, the stars and the constellations all cry with us. And I'm wishing that we can be the people who, when we are opposite someone who is in need, that we can respond to them. And that also that when we cry out at night in the darkness, that there's someone who cries with us and who hears us. And so um, as we continue through these nights, um, I'm gonna keep thinking about uh, the teachings from my friend Rabbi Avi Killip and from Kelly Lewis, the what else is true? What else is true? What else can we find here? What can be in that gift of darkness? Chag to all of you. Thank you. Chag thank you.